Okay, so I'm going to talk about chytridiomycosis in frogs, which um, is kind of random, but I got to work with this disease this summer, so it was just kind of really convenient for me to talk about it, and not a lot of people know about it, and it's really important to talk about it. So, chytridiomycosis is a disease affecting the skin in frogs. So, chytrid is the, a type of fungus, um, and mycosis means a disease caused by a fungus. So this is caused by the chytrid fungus. And so what happens is in adult frogs, the fungus actually gets under the skin and destroys the keratin there. And then this causes skin sloughing, which means they just shed their skin, um, lethargy, lesions, um, red skin. So you can see in these two pictures here, these frogs have unfortunately died. And you can see here, and on the legs of this one, and kind of on the arms too, the skin is red there from the chytrid fungus. And then eventually what happens is this causes, causes an electrolyte imbalance and then leads to cardiac arrest and death. So this happens because frogs absorb almost all of their nutrients if they don't eat it through their skin. And so since the skin is destroyed, basically they can't absorb any of these nutrients, so they just kind of die. And then in tadpoles, it's a little bit different because the only keratinized parts are in the mouth. So this just kind of like impedes feeding and slows down development. So tadpoles don't really die from this. They just develop much more, much slower than um, a tadpole that is not affected by the chytrid fungus. So it, it's kind of hard to diagnose frogs with this. Um, when you have them in captivity because usually you don't want to go through and do an invasive because one thing you can do is you can take a sample of the skin and look at it under the microscope but you don't really just want to that's really invasive to take off a part of the skin especially for frogs since their skin is so important um, but another way to do this is through field work and so basically you go out you catch a frog you swab the skin and then you run what is called a PCR to determine if there had been any chytrid fungus DNA on the skin. So these are three frogs that we actually found this summer in field work, they're really cute. So these are some of the species in uh, Tippecanoe County that actually carry the chytrid fungus. So more on our field work. So this actually is being, like, being done worldwide because the chytrid fungus is found worldwide and so you you can see in this top picture we have our nice setup in the dark with our headlamps on because we have to do this when the frogs are active and you catch a frog and then down here I'm actually swabbing this tree frog stomach you swab the stomach the inner thighs and the feet and then you take the swabs back to the lab we put them in this nice little tray and then we clip off the ends and take them back to the lab so from this field work, we have found that like out of the approximately 7,800 species of frogs, only 1,400 have been tested for and 700 species of frogs have tested positive. And a huge thing about this disease is that approximately right now, 33% of all species of amphibians are either endangered or threatened. And this is really due to the chytrid fungus. And another thing about chytridiomycosis is that it can drive a perfectly healthy population to extinction in just a few weeks. So it's really fast acting and it's kind of destroying all these um, amphibian, not just frogs, but salamanders and other and toads too, to, uh, to extinction. So it's really important to understand the life cycle of this, so the actual scientific name is really long. It's Bacterococytrium dendrobotitis. I practice that multiple times this summer because it's hard to say, but we just call it BD. <laughs> and it's an aquatic fungus that is prevalent, so that's why these frogs can get it because it's able to live in the water. And so up here we have our zoospores. So these are asexual spores. And something really unique to BD is that they actually have a flagellum so they can move through the water. 
Whereas regular zoospores for other fungus, they don't have a flagellum, so they aren't able to move. So then after about three days, they insist and they become what are called sporangia. So you can start seeing here, this is a developing sporangia and they actually form more zoospores. So in this picture here, you can see that in this developing sporangia, these tiny dots or these like lumps are more zoospores. And then once the sporangia become mature, you lose this cap here and the zoospores are released out into their environment to swim away and proliferate to create more sporangia. So this is how it kind of grows. So under this microscope, I took these pictures and counted about all these little dots on here for about 1200 pictures. It was awful. <laughs> and so right here we see a zoospore, this tiny black dot, and then this is a good example of a sporangia. And then we have this gif here, so all these moving dots are actually zoospores swimming through um, the, their liquid under the microscope. So you can do this, you can take a skin sample and try to see this under a microscope to diagnose, but it's really invasive, so usually we just run PCR. So one thing that we could do to treat this is if you have like a pet frog and you notice these um, symptoms, you can actually treat with an antifungal and then really clean out the tank they're in, probably throw away everything that's in there, get new stuff, clean it with bleach. Um, but you, they have kind of created this series of baths in itricano, okay, and an antifungal medication Very that um, actually kills the fungus. But in the wild, we really can't do anything because you have these huge populations of frogs and you have these tiny zoospores and you just can't ensure that dumping all this antifungal isn't going to kill other species. So really, there's nothing that we can do other than try to prevent this from spreading. Speaking of spreading, it's really interesting how we found out the chytrid fungus is actually um, worldwide. So on this map here, these are um, the number of samples found in each uh, like on each continent. So we can see Australia has a lot. So a lot of the studies have been done in Australia on the chytrid fungus. Um, North America does not have as many, but that doesn't mean that it's not here. Um, we have these sites in Tippecanoe County that we have looked at and out of the, um, I think we have nine sites out of the nine, seven have, have prevalence for the fungus. Now that doesn't mean that these frogs are actually presenting symptoms and presenting the disease for chytridiomycosis, but that does mean they're carriers for the fungus and later they could actually become um, infected with the disease. So it used, it used to be thought that this fungus began in um, Africa and then just kind of spread over 23,000 years. But actually in May of 2018, so really recently, Science published an article and, um, that suggests that it actually began in Southeast Asia because that's where um, the, they did some like, DNA um, studies on it and that it actually started in the 1900s. And due to worldwide trading and especially the exotic pet trading um, business, we actually have seen the spread of the chytrid fungus to other parts of the world. And so what happens is these people get these frogs that have the fungus and they don't know what to do with them so they just release them into the wild and then this is very, um, it spreads very rapidly and so the zoospores come off that frog, enter the water systems and infect other frogs and then eventually it just starts killing off populations. So unfortunately we don't really have a lot we can do for it now in the wild. Um, we're still working on that, what we were working on this summer. Um, a lot of people have seen that um, sodium chloride, which is a natural antifungal agent, can help with that. So that's what we were studying this summer. But um, it's really detrimental that we work to kind of get rid of this fungus and get rid of this disease because amphibians are really important to our ecological systems and they're dying because of this. So, but yeah, are there any questions? Questions about that?
Um, I, got a, I do have a question, because yeah. one of the students and I, just in the 30th of this month, we're going to a reptile show at the Indy State Fairgrounds. Oh, cool. Do they swab uh, those animals? You know what I mean? Reptiles? They, yeah, you know, at this reptile show? Um, sure probably no. They I mean, if, they, if they're frogs, they, they might. Okay. Um, but it doesn't really affect reptiles because reptiles don't really use their skin oh, okay. for so be frogs or all of that. But amphibians um, do. Um, they might okay. be salamanders. So. And then you said the skin absorbs nutrients, right? Yes. Give me some examples of nutrients. Of nutrients. Okay, yeah, so like. I'm trying to picture. Okay, so like a lot of the electrolytes they use, so that's why it causes a huge electrolyte imbalance, are absorbed through their skin. So like sodium plus. Yeah. Chloride sodium um, through the skin. Through the skin, and then um, in lungless salamanders, because there's some salamander species that don't have lungs, um, this fungus actually causes them to not be able to breathe because they breathe through their skin and then they suffocate. Yeah. Okay, let's give everybody a round of applause, all three of them today.